So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us here today. Really delighted to be here to uh, speak at the launch of the Global Terrorism Index um, here in Dublin. Um, Serge is about to provide us with a very comprehensive overview, a very well-rehearsed overview of the key findings of this really important report. So my job is really to contextualize some of those findings, um, to reflect on their policy implications and significance, um, and really to kind of look at the, the broader trends that we're seeing um, globally and how these trends in political violence and terrorism are overlapping with some of the other forces that are impacting our world. So I think that the, the report that we've all got in our hands points to a mixed picture when we're thinking about uh, trends in violent extremism and terrorism. For me, it points to a landscape in transition. We see terrorism deaths in decline, but we continue to see record highs in the number of countries that are plagued by terrorism. Despite a 20-year counterinsurgency effort in Afghanistan, the Taliban has overtaken ISIS as the deadliest terrorist group globally. And whilst Islamist extremism still represents the greatest global terrorism threat, far-right terror has risen in Western countries for three years running. And increasingly, we're seeing women as the purveyors of terrorist violence around the world. Now, I think that um, before we sort of look into these trends in greater detail, I, I think we need to think about what this kind of data really tells us about what we're seeing internationally. It tells us about violence as an indicator of um, conflict, of extremism, of socioeconomic hardship, um, and of identity challenges in manifesting in different ways around the world. But it's also worth stressing that terrorism and political violence is a symptom rather than a cause. So we need to be contextualizing this with the evidence around the factors precipitating this global challenge as well, and really going behind the data. So as mentioned earlier, the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London, we're focused on understanding and innovating real world responses to these challenges, um, including the rising tide of polarization, hate and extremism we're seeing internationally. We bring ethnographic research um, expertise in international extremist movements and a sort of digital policy focus as well um, to then provide policy advisory support to governments um, and uh, civil society organizations and companies seeking to uh, challenge this rising tide. And by really coming to things like the, the Global Terrorism Index, we're able to take data-driven solutions and really to take these to, to scale those and to provide them uh, with the opportunity to pilot and to almost provide a petri dish for what works in um, demonstrating attitudinal and behavioral change when it comes to these kind of dynamics we're seeing internationally. So as those of you who will flick through this, um, this index, there are a number of key trends that I want to just unpack in slightly more detail. Um, the three that I want to focus on during this talk are looking at the global proliferation of far-right terrorist violence. I want to be looking at the sustained challenge of Islamist extremism globally and also pointing to the role of gender in terrorism and that transitioning role. And I promise I won't steal your spotlight, Serge, because I know you've got lots of exciting data to present, um, but really to sort of contextualize those challenges. Um, so the, the, the GTI points to a rise of 300%, I believe, um, in global, in far-right violence over the past three years. Um, and I think that this is something we're seeing um, as a kind of cresting wave um, of far-right violence, uh, sorry, far-right extremist sentiment that we've seen growing over the past few years. Um, we've seen increasing mobilization online and offline um, that is increasingly manifesting now in the political violence that we've seen across Europe and North America in particular, in Halle, in Poway, in, in Christchurch, um, of course, last year most famously, um, and in El Paso, um, where we're seeing a picture of a growing terror network with roots in alt-right culture and online safe havens that are emerging, rather than just isolated events that are being carried out by people holding similar beliefs. So one of the precipitating factors behind this rise are some of the theories that underp underpin this, this growing global movement, including the Great Replacement Theory, which was the title of the manifesto of the Christchurch attacker. Um, this has come to dominate the ideology of extreme right groups and provide ideological glue, which ties together this increasingly cohesive, uh, networked and transnational extreme right. This great replacement theory is able to inspire calls for, for extreme action from its adherents, including the violence that we've seen in places like New Zealand, 
but also through nonviolent calls for ethnic cleansing, for so-called remigration, which actually uh, provide the, the sort of mood music to calls for genocide against individual people. And uh, also this is underpinned by a sense of accelerationist urgency that uh, really makes the case for why violent action needs to be taken now. A quick reflection on, on this kind of, how these sort of uh, conspiracy theories um, cross-cut with political violence. The form of extremism that we're seeing manifest here ultimately seeks social and political change and is premised on the supremacy of an in-group over a, an out-group and the subsequent dehumanization of that out-group. And that really is the kind of the notion of um, extremism that can manifest both violently and non-violently. And I think it's really important to remind us now, we, you know, often the kind of conversation about human rights is, is extremely at the forefront of, of these conversations around counterterrorism. But I really do want to emphasize the importance of human rights within this context, because the notion of the dehumanization of the other and the notion of not respecting the rights of others, which I know is one of the indicators that are used for the positive peace index that, um, that uh, the uh, Institute for um, Economics and Peace produce, is premised on this idea that human rights is not a universal um, factor. And so I think when, we, when we're speaking about counterterrorism and counterextremism, it's useful to bear in mind that this, at the heart of these efforts, is this defense of human rights and the rights of others, um, and that we can't understand it detached from that. Indeed, if we uh, detach counterterrorism and counterextremism from this consideration about human rights, you end up with a highly relativized notion of what terrorism and extremism stands for, where you see the abuse of this kind of terminology um, to police thought, uh, to re-educate, um, and, um, and to essentially curb views that are not conducive to a certain government or governing party's perspective. So I think it's really important that we kind of have that human rights angle at the heart there. Now, uh, whilst we're talking about this, this growth in far-right terrorism and um, far-right extremism in parallel, this rise is incredibly significant, but it's also worth bearing in mind that this globally is dwarfed uh, quantitatively by the scale of Islamist extremism that we've seen. I think there's a risk that even as we've seen a drop-off in the number of terrorist attacks, um, which is largely down to the uh, reduction of um, uh, the area that is governed by um, ISIS across Iraq and Syria, that there is a risk in seeing this ideological challenge as a done deal. The way that we need to understand groups such as ISIS and Al-Qaeda is in several, in several ways, that they, uh, they bring a ideological, a propaganda, and a territorial entity in, into their, um, their operations. Now, the actions, the kind of largely counter-terrorism framed actions um, that have been taken by the international community have largely sought to degrade the territorial entity of, of, uh, of ISIS across Iraq and Syria and its further provinces, as well as its propaganda machinery. And this has taken place in the online space as well as um, in targeting its, its media operations. But it's, we need to learn from the history of countering these, these Salafi jihadi Islamist groups that uh, this also exists as an ideological entity. And while the group has been dismantled in terms of its propaganda and territory, we cannot make the mistake of assuming that, that the ideology has been defeated as well. ISIS was not born out of a vacuum. It was able to thrive in a context where the underlying conditions still remain in, in its heartlands. We see, uh, we see major failures in governance, sectarian tensions and conflict environments, and, and Serge will speak to the ways that conflict and terrorism are overlapping um, in key parts of the world, um, which precipitated ISIS's global rise, as well as the resilience of um, al-Qaeda affiliates around the world as well. In particular, the Global Terrorism Index points to several key hubs um, in which this resilience is particularly evident in the Horn of Africa, in West Africa, including the Sahel, and major concerns around the joining together of a sort of Sahelian, Maghrebian um, uh, op area of operations for these Islamist groups with a broader Lake Chad, West African basis and increasing um, exchanges between uh, Islamist terrorist groups in these contexts, um, as well as in the AFPAC region and the rise in um, uh, of Afghanistan to number one in the index kind of points to the the resilience of, of these groups in that context. So I think that um, the, we need to bear in mind that the Islamist challenge is not complete, uh, is not uh, finished, and actually we need to be understanding the interaction between Islamism and the far right when we look at uh, upcoming terrorism and extremism challenges. It's not a zero-sum game that exists between these. We can't flip our entire apparatus and machinery to reflect a far right challenge. Um, 
at the expense of looking at Islamist terrorism. Instead, these movements thrive off one another, and in fact, they are learning from each other regularly. The far right, for instance, has taken a page out of uh, the Islamic State book by using its social media platforms to identify people with public propaganda content, and they're targeting them for um, individual private conversations, including on encrypted platforms online, um, to start the spiral of, of radicalization. Showing that our responses need to be three-pronged. We need to be looking at um, a comprehensive regulation question when it comes to the online space. We need to be competing with, um, uh, with, these, with these narratives as they manifest online. And we also need to be educating. We need to be um, doing all these things at the same time and, and really building out a comprehensive response to, um, to violent extremism across the ide ideological spectrum. Whilst also recognizing the distinct challenges that these threats pose. So whilst, um, whilst far-right terrorism is, um, is on a frightening trajectory, really a major concern that we're seeing is about other tactics that are being used by far-right extremists to mainstream their narratives through media, through politics, and through activism. We've seen the proliferation of far-right populist parties across Europe who have been able to successfully enter um, extremist concepts, ideologies, and narratives into mainstream political discourse. And this really does open up uh, a lot of space for these, these groups to operate in and, and really sows the seeds for the long-term resilience of, of these groups in, in Western countries. Of course, in Western countries, the um, Islamist challenge is still um, held up by a lot of security agencies as a primary security threat, but the far-right terrorism threat is the fastest growing, and it's very important that we recognize the differing tactics that are being used by these, uh, by these different ideological uh, campaigns. So finally, I, I want to end on a point about, about the uh, findings about gender that are pre prevalent in the report, um, including the rise of uh, female suicide bombers, um, not least in, um, in West Africa, in the Boko Haram and um, Lake Chad Basin extremist groups. And throughout this, this presentation, I've really been trying to point to the fact that the role of violence is often ambivalent within these terrorist groups. Um, we, for too long, as a kind of policymaker community, really thought of um, women exclusively through the lens of victimhood when it came to um, their engagement with extremist movements. There's a much greater diversity in um, drivers for women to be joining these groups. Often they map onto similar drivers that we've seen for uh, men joining extremist organizations, a sense of adventure, perhaps an ideological conviction, and the ability to kind of play upon specific identity features um, that are prevalent within local communities and extremist groups able to mobilize those highly local factors. But I think underpinning this is really an opportunism when we see the use of, of, of women for, um, to carry out acts of political violence in this context. Uh, we're seeing that violence is being used as a tactic and nonviolence is, is, a, is a strategy um, sorry, that nonviolence is, is, a, is a tactical distinction rather than a strategic distinction. It's important to distinguish between strategic nonviolence, which is pragmatic and open to adaption, and principled nonviolence, which is consistent and committed. And I think what we've seen very often with women's involvement in extremist movements is, a, um, is about a strategic approach to nonviolence rather than a principled approach to nonviolence. Um, and really, there is this sense of opportunism that extremist groups use. Um, to justify the um, involvement of, of women within their movement um, through violent and nonviolent means. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think those are really just some framing statements to, to capture some of the key differences we've seen in this year's data. Um, it's really important that we think about um, political violence and terrorism in terms of trends. I'm really pleased that the Global Terrorism Index allows us to look at the trajectory and the uh, future direction of travel. Um, but I think that we need to be thinking about this uh, mapping of violence and of um, the, the manifestations of extremist ideology through violence <coughs> through that long lens um, and really anticipating future challenges so that we're not, for instance, catching up with a growing far-right terrorist threat. And we're not um, assuming that a decline in um, Islamist-inspired terrorism is therefore the sign of a kind of end of an era. Um, so really, over to Serge and to provide a sort of data picture of um, what we've seen in 2019. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much.
Is this working? It should. Well, thank you very much for uh, having the Institute for Economics and Peace again at uh, this institute, being able to uh, present. Thank you very much, Milo, for an excellent uh, uh, keynote address. And I'm already looking forward to uh, the UK launch in London at ISD next month and um, to do this, uh, to have a gig again about uh, terrorism and the Global Terrorism uh, Index. Um, so yeah, let's uh, start with it. Some of the slides will be very, very quick because I was very well introduced to uh, give my, my speech. So yes, we measure and quantify the drivers of, uh, of peace and also the benefits, the economic benefits that a more peaceful uh, situation can deliver. So that's why we have a flagship uh, publication, the Global Peace Index, every year in June, but we have other more national indexes, uh, the, the topical index, uh, indexes like the uh, work we do on the progress on the SDG 16. And one of the indicators of the Global Peace Index is terrorism. Uh, we have seen more than, uh, I would say, four or five years ago when we experienced the peak of terrorism in, in the West and, and throughout the world, that when this indicator was fluctuating, it had a very large impact on the overall Global Peace Index. That's why, and because data sets were available, we decided to extract it and to create a specific index called the Global Terrorism Index. Uh, we have um, offices throughout the world, so uh, IP, the Institute for Economics and Peace, is uh, based in Sydney, Australia. We have offices in New York, connected to the office in Mexico City for the Mexico Peace Index that we produce every year. I am heading the office in Brussels. We still have colleagues in The Hague, and we opened at the end of 2018 an office in Harare, where we try to implement a positive peace with the local uh, government. So we also uh, do a lot of research for international organizations, university kind, professors kind of like or, or work to in, include in their, um, in, their, in their courses and in their classes, a lot of downloads. Basically, next to the research, we also try to reach out to the entire world and, and you know, connect people, connect people with our work, with the, re the, the results of our research. We created a set or I would say network of IP ambassadors that are really bringing out, especially into specific communities where it is needed, the research results. All right, so what is the Global Terrorism Index? Seventh year, 163 countries, where are the missing 30? Those are countries that are too small in size, of in size of population to be statistically relevant or not to have a negative impact on a statistical ranking like the, the index that we have at hand. We measure and we, we, quanti we, we rank uh, countries according to the relative impact of terrorism. As said, it's an indicator of the GPI. We do it ourselves and overlooked by a panel of international experts. We are in the field of social sciences, soft sciences, so there is no globally accepted definition of uh, terrorism. So that's why in our collaboration with the START consortium uh, that are compiling the Global Terrorism Database, we are using uh, the definition you see on the, on the screen, so the use of illegal force and violence by non-state actors, that's very, a very important uh, data there, to attain a political, economic, religious or social goal through fear, coercion or intimidation. So based on this definition, Start Consortium, University of Maryland is compiling the Global Terrorist Database. We press this database through the filter of four indicators, the amount of incidents, people injured, people being killed, and the damage to property, a different weight to all, to each of those uh, indicators. We also identify terrorism as being a form of violence that is much more persistent than others. So that's why over a period of five years, we take half the value of the previous year into, into the index. I, I would say we do a job as uh, statistics uh, specialists. We also include socioeconomic indicators to be able to do basically what we did, Milo, is try to analyze the data we produce and also identify the trends and give some, uh, I would say, more in-depth explanation to the results that I'm going to talk about right now. Uh, this is, so for each index that we produce, we also, everything is available online on our website called visionofhumanity.org. And for each of index, you have an interactive map like this one. So you can basically click on each country on the map and get the data, the ranking, data per indicator, really going into the details of each and every country. This map also allows you to already identify, I would say, the hotspots of terrorism throughout the world, or at least those regions that are most impacted. And it also allows you to identify those 26 
small green patches, and those are countries that have not been affected by terrorism in the past five years. So this is the, uh, I would say for this index, almost the infamous top, uh, top 10. And when you look at those countries, you could have the reaction and say, well, obvious, those are the usual suspects that you would uh, expect to find back in the top 10 of a global terrorism index. And it's also the case. Um, but I think the most uh, important change of the past year is the number one ranking. So since 2003, Iraq has been number one on the global terrorism index. This has changed last year, and you will see in the figures afterwards dramatically. Uh, so when, you look, when we look at the key findings, so good news and bad news. So a decrease in the impact of terrorism, decrease in the number of people getting killed by, uh, by terrorism, down by 15%. And if you would open this time window to the past four years, or really compare the peak in 2014 to those data collected in 2018 and early 2019, you will clearly see a decrease by more than 50%, going down from uh, short of 36,000 getting killed in 2014 to uh, just above 15,000 last year. So clearly 52% in the amount of uh, casualties. More countries improved and deteriorated, so that's good news. But we also see that more countries get impacted by uh, the phenomenon on terrorism. So we had 67 uh, the, in the past year, went up to 71, and 71 the second highest level, second highest number of countries impacted by terrorism. So as Milo, as we have said, the impact is going down, but the phenomenon is still spreading and is very, very present uh, in the world. Uh, I said 26 countries. For Europe, good news, and those are the same figures than last year. Again, 70% uh, decrease in the amount of casualties, 62 last year. Uh, Turkey is inside the Europe basket in the index, 40 occur in Turkey. So if you really look at Europe as we, we know Europe, only 22. Uh, yeah, so, and the three countries most affected by it in the EU would be the UK, France and Belgium. No, taking, into, taking in mind also that you have this half value over five years, so that's why those countries are uh, in the top three for Europe. Now, when we look at this number one position of Afghanistan, we had a decrease last year of the, the amount of uh, casualties uh, created by the Islamic State by more than 70% in Syria and Iraq. So this is a clear uh, consequence of the military action of the coalition against Daesh, so very successful in crushing the capabilities of this organization. On the other hand, we saw an increase by more than 70% of the amount of casualties created by the Taliban. And those, those figures are to me really, really mind-blowing. So uh, from the global number of casualties, 38% were uh, created by the end of the Taliban. And if in the index you will find also a list of the most, it's very difficult to call them successful, but the most impactful uh, attacks last year in the top 10, in the top 20, you will see that the vast majority, if not all of the attacks, occurred in Afghanistan. So the most impactful, successful uh, attacks last year all occurred in one country, Afghanistan. And that's also a huge difference with the previous years because the Islamic State was active in a lot of different countries and were creating casualties in those countries. So those figures that are now comparable to the figures uh, linked to the Taliban, the Taliban are only creating those casualties in only one country, and this is uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and therefore, of course, Afghanistan is the most impact, most affected uh, country by terrorism last, uh, last year, followed by Iraq, Nigeria, Syria, and Pakistan. Out of these top five, only Afghanistan and Nigeria had worst figures last year than the year before. Iraq, Syria, and Pakistan improved, uh, so basically decreased the amount of uh, casualties. We also see, as you said, Milo, an that's exponential, exponential growth of the impact of far-right terrorism up 320% in the amount of uh, casualties and the amount of attacks, both on both sides of the Atlantic, but basically it's a, we could even say it's a global phenomenon, still concentrated in about 19 countries in Northern America, Europe, Western Europe, and Oceania. Uh, and those figures are going to continue to evolve exponentially again in the past year. So this increase, so those figures for 2018 were just short of 30 casualties in 2018. Those are the figures at the end of September when this uh, index was compiled, compiled la last year. 77 plus 2 in Halle, Germany in October, 79. So if you go from just short of, of 30 
to 79 in one year, you can just imagine how this graph is going to continue to, uh, to evolve. And we have been very lucky in Aller Germany. The Germans are building very strong doors because if this guy would have had the opportunity to enter into the synagogue, we might have doubled those figures of 77 and 79. Uh, so this is showing you the evolution per country and it clearly showing you this, this increase in Afghanistan and Nigeria and a decrease in the other top countries uh, last year. So really 15% between 17 and uh, 18. Uh, when you look at this, you clearly see 46%. So uh, if you take the Taliban, but also this Khorasan chapter of uh, Islamic State in Afghanistan, Together, they are responsible for almost 50% of the casualties worldwide. So almost one out of two people that was killed by terrorists last year fell in Afghanistan by those two organizations. 87%, so close to 90% of all terrorist attacks and all terrorist deaths last, uh, last year was uh, committed in only those 10 countries. So there is a clear concentration of the phenomenon of, uh, of terrorism and countries with larger impacts than others. And it's really when you look at those figures in Afghanistan and Nigeria that are creating the figures in the past, in the past year. The rises of the fall, so that's good news. So Iraq, Somalia, Egypt, so those are the countries that had a clear decrease in the past, in the past year. And those are those countries that are really have been more impacted last year. And what is really disturbing for me there is a concentration of African countries in those risers uh, last year. The impact of terrorism, uh, the economic impact. So this is only linked to the four indicators that we use. Uh, we do not uh, include there the indirect economic impact, for example, on tourism after a terrorist attack, because those figures are not always correct and very difficult to put together. And the other uh, economic impact that we do not have in those statistics are the extra investment <laughs> made in uh, security and intelligence forces, because those data are usually uh, at least confidential, if not uh, secret. But still, 33 billion, the in economic impact was 33 billion last year, so a lot of money, 33 billion. But if you compare this to the overall cost of violence that we, uh, that we basically put together for the Global Peace Index every year, uh, we were at 14.1 trillion uh, US dollars last year. So it's marginal compared to the overall cost of violence, but it's still 33 billion, very, very impactful. And you can see that for specific countries like uh, <laughs> Afghanistan, only terrorism is already eating up close to 20% of this country's uh, GDP. So if we open the time window to uh, at least a decade, uh, this is the graph that you would, uh, you would get uh, starting into 2002. Different ways to look at this graph, so you can either look at this and identify what we would call the fourth wave of terrorism, really impacted by uh, religious motivation, or at least extreme re religious motivation for this type of, uh, of terrorism. Uh, and then you could ask yourself, have we been successful here? Is this like the end of this fourth wave? Uh, or is this just another subwave? And are we going to see another increase in 2020, 2021? Uh, when you look at the different influx of the graph and you look, go down and you look at the, the different uh, uh, years in which it happened, you can easily link this to uh, decisions or at least movements in uh, international politics and Western foreign policy, uh, basically creating, as you have said, this fertile soil or even windows of opportunity for, for example, 2007, uh, al-Zarqawi to create Islamic State in Iraq, and 2014, al-Baghdadi doing the same and opening it to, uh, um, to the Levant, so to Syria also. So you can ask yourself, is this just another subwave, and what will be the windows of opportunity that we are going to create in this year, next year, or in 2022? Uh, and is this going to re-emerge, the same type of threat, the same type of terrorism, the same groups, other groups, other type of terrorism? What are we facing? I guess this is something that specialists need to have a look on, and we can have a discussion about this uh, afterwards in the, in the Q&A. Uh, the deadliest terrorist groups in the world, so we clearly see the red line uh, is the Islamic State, Boko Haram is the yellow line, so there against the military action against this group, very effective a couple of years ago, decreases by 70 and 80 percent in the impact. The brown line, the Taliban, and the blue line, this uh, Islam, uh, Islamic State chapter in, in Afghanistan, are permanently on the rise with really large, large impact in 2018.
Uh, this is a slide showing, you know, as I explained to you that 71 uh, countries had been impacted by terrorism last year. You clearly see a plateau since 2011-12 of large numbers of countries being impacted by terrorism. So this is not just a phenomenon of, of the past year or the past two years, but you clearly see a plateau that you can start to identify in 2005, 6, 7, 8, and then another one starting in 2011, 12, 13. By region, that's a very interesting slide because this is showing you, a, this is explaining to you a lot of things. First of all, you can see that South Asia, that's basically AFPAC, as you, as you called it, and the Middle East, so the MENA region, uh, had the same amount of incidents in the past, uh, in the past years, in the past uh, decade, even 16 years. But those incidents were much more effective or create much more casualties close to one of the thousands in, in the MENA region compared to, uh, to AFPAC. So you clearly see more effective uh, attacks over there. You also clearly see a concentration of the phenomenon of terrorism, at least the impact of terrorism, in three regions. Uh, the MENA region, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And after, uh, I would say, the crush of Daesh last year, you clearly also see a redistribution of the remaining uh, capacities over other conflicts in Nigeria, in the Sahel, and also to uh, Afghanistan, unfortunately. Uh, this is also a slide who should uh, do other things. It's basically also debunk the narrative, the political narrative in the West that terrorism is like the number one source of insecurity in our societies. Of course, when you get targeted by a terrorist attack and every victim that fell uh, under a terrorist attack is one too much, Don't, do not get me wrong. But when you compare this to other regions and the impact of other regions, that's really, we are really not at the forefront receiving the full impact of terrorism. The full impact of terrorism is occurring in other parts of the world, in which we are also very active, uh, by the way. Uh, so yeah, so a lot of, of information there. And it was really, really special to, to talk about this in, in a country like Mexico that was clearly facing uh, other troubles than uh, terrorist activities back uh, in the days. And I was in Mexico when President Trump uh, declared the, the, the narco cartels as being terrorist groups. So, destabilizing for uh, this country. 320% uh, increase for far-right terrorism, you clearly, clearly see there. And as I explained before, uh, 2019, we'll have a figure that will be up there. So this graph is really going to skyrocket uh, next year. So this trend, and of course, marginal in figures compared to the overall impact of terrorism, is there, is fastly growing, and is uh, steadily growing, and is conti continued to grow, to grow in the past year. We also did an analysis and compared the impact over a period of almost 50 years uh, between far-left and far-right terrorism. So the red line on the graphs are for far-left terrorism and the blue lines are for far-right terrorism. So the conclusion that you can uh, really draw from this comparison over 50 years is that uh, far-left terrorism has been much more prolific in the amount of uh, attacks, but less, uh, I would say, effective in creating uh, casualties. Of course, those casualties for far right come in peaks, and we will have Christchurch in 2019 create a, a new peak. But still, we clearly see that uh, far left terrorism is not really uh, there to create a lot of casualties. And if they create casualties, those are really targeted casualties. And I remember when I was much younger than today, uh, for example, far left German uh, groups really targeting CEOs of main uh, multinational and companies in. In Germany. Um, you clearly see that for far right in, I would say, certain periods of time and in certain incidents, it's clearly there to create mass casualties, so at least have a larger impact in the number of, uh, of casualties. So by the ideology, this is a graph that is really, really uh, telling you a lot. It's clearly showing you that many other forms of terrorism have impacted us uh, in previous decades, and this is really going through uh, I was born in 1969, so very depressing slide for me because my uh, year of birth is not, not even on the slide anymore. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah, when you look at this, this is basically my youth, and that's what I said. It's like on the news every day in the UK with the IRA, in France with Action Direct, or with this uh, Palestinian Liberation uh, Front, many, many different sources of terrorism that also impacted the West and also impacted... Uh, um, or countries in, here in, in, in Europe, and for many, many reasons. So, of course, we saw resurgence of this religious type of uh, 
of terrorism. And be careful, that's the West. So if you would do this for the world, the orange fire would be much larger because in those most affected regions, this is clearly the motivation for the use of terrorism. And in the West, you clearly see that nationalist and separatist uh, motivation is on the decrease. Therefore, political violence and the use of violence in, in politics, I, I, I would say, is really the main cause for the use of terrorism and, of course, the resurgence of religion, but still a clear difference with the political motivation <coughs> for the use of terrorism. Far-right movements, uh, big difference with the jihadist movements. There is no rush to claim, there is no like international organization that is going to claim the attacks committed by the lone wolves. Uh, I don't like the term lone wolves because those guys have been inspired, so I like to call them like lonely wolves following a larger pack of wolves, of influenced wolves. Uh, but still, those are individual actors committing, uh, using violence to basically make the point of the narrative that is well organized online and that is well propagated. And it's also part, uh, unfortunately, in many, many uh, recognized political formation within the European Parliament and within uh, the uh, national governments and even uh, parliamentary governments also in, in Europe. So you have a, a narrative, political narrative that is extreme, it's becoming more and more mainstream, even if it's extreme. There is a narrative online that is specific, and you spoke about this, this narrative really going from one actor to the next actor. But there is no, I would say, movement of large organization claiming these individual attacks. So that's the main difference with jihadist type of uh, terrorism. We have also seen, and I guess this is really uh, aiming at Northern America, but we have also seen that mass shootings, so four casualties and more, uh, more and more of those uh, mass shootings have been identified as uh, terrorist attacks. Why? And it look at the years of, and the start of the increase, because terrorism came more and more into the debate. We have identified terrorism as a form of violence, uh, therefore, uh, so yeah, closer, closer look on those mass shootings having a potential uh, terrorist motivation. But the, on the other hand, you clearly see also that this is still less than 20% of all potential mass uh, shootings. Uh, one but last point, the link between conflict and terrorism. So this is an evolution of the amount of casualties falling under the two type of uh, violence. So uh, battle death and death from terrorism. And you see a clear parallelism between those two graphs showing you that terrorism in most of the conflicts that we see today worldwide is one of the tactics, techniques or procedures that are used by mostly the non-state actors because the conflicts that we see today is basically non-state actors facing non-state actors in an environment where the state cannot exercise its power anymore. Uh, so we clearly see that there is a correlation. More than 90% of all terrorist attacks in the world occurred in a country that is engaged in at least one violent conflict or having of a conflict on uh, its uh, soil. Uh, the more intense the conflict, the more terrorism will be used and the more casualties will fall uh, through the, the action of, uh, of terrorism. Uh, the targets are also completely different. So a country that is engaged in a violent conflict, you will see that the terrorist group or the insurgency group, sometimes it's very difficult to make uh, the difference. You also see that the same groups can be a um, terrorist group in one region, it can be an insurgency in the other region, depending on the pressure that you put on them. So it's really morphing, morphing a lot. But you see in countries that are engaged in a conflict that the targets are hard type of targets, so police, military, um, infrastructure, representation of the state, but also representation, I would say, the competition, all the terrorist groups and uh, non-state uh, militias. On the other hand, in countries that are not engaged in this violent conflict, the targets will be much softer, business, journalists, media, tourists, and I would say, uh, the entire population as uh, such. Last point before getting to the Q&A, it's on gender and terrorism. This is a very interesting slide because this is uh, showing you that um, most of the time terrorist groups have the, have the element of initiative and surprise, a reaction, and then of course counter-terrorism adapted and a steep decrease. So when you look at those two peaks, those are clearly um, initiative or surprises by, the, by some of the uh, terrorist groups, reaction by the uh, security and the intelligence community, and then a steep decrease because it's not going to happen anymore. Just imagine concrete blocks in our streets only came after a truck ran into people in Nice, not before. So we are always like 
on our heels, on our heels, and not really predicting what's going to happen uh, happen next. But we are really good at reacting and then providing uh, good answers. This is slightly different in the current peak. It's much larger, and you will see it's going to continue and have more like 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 a plateau. So this is against 80% Boko Haram. So this is this te technique to basically give a new rucksack to a young girl uh, going to school in northeastern uh, Nigeria. And you, you make sure that this girl with the new rucksack passes through the marketplace to go to school. And then you remotely uh, detonate the uh, device that is in the rucksack. So I would say that a lot of the actors here were not aware that they were, became a terrorist, a terrorist actor. Next to this, and this is then comparable to the other peaks. I remember this preparing and also deploying to Afghanistan. Uh, in the preparation, they were telling us, you need to be very careful for uh, haircut, well-shaved, perfumed men, well-dressed well men, because those guys prepared to meet God in the same afternoon. So basically, those, those were very dangerous. And this evolved during the presentation while deployed. And you need to be careful for tall women wearing a burqa, because th those were not women. Uh, but the focus of security services were not on women. So basically, the terrorist actors disguised in a woman to not be identified as a potential actor. And under a burqa, you can even place more explosive without being uh, recognized, I would say. Uh, so that's an example of those peaks, and also the example of this peak for Boko Haram. On the other <laughs> hand, we see that in the evolution, the more you put the pressure on those terrorist groups, um, the more women can adapt to different roles. There are different motivations for women to join these, uh, these groups, and there again, fight for gender equality, having the opportunity to also be a fighter for those groups. But you also see that uh, the role of women evolves from being a victim of those groups, being state builders, because while the, I would say the husbands or the men were fighting for IS, they, were, they built the, the society and they built the state as, as such, uh, and becoming actors uh, uh, themselves. We clearly saw in the past year, past years, also transfer of female population from uh, different countries into the Islamic State. And one of the main, or one of the most remarkable transfer came from uh, China into the Islamic State. So I don't have to explain to you which part of China, and which part, which ethnic group in China those women came from. But you clearly see that this, I would call it, uh, conflict in China also started a, a female FTF. Uh, movement towards the Islamic State, or at least groups that uh, were affiliated to, to the Islamic State. A last point, uh, it's also uh, figures for foreign terrorist fighters or people active in Syria and Iraq leaving the country are completely different for men, where we saw that about 50% of all men were able to leave the country, basically being arrested and then I would say, uh, extradited to the countries, but also leaving to other conflicts in the world. So this figure is close to 50%. For female, for women, this is down to 18%. So women are really stuck into the region, cannot get out, usually have more difficulties to travel, having at least one to three kids along with them. Uh, those kids having different fathers, because we have been very, very good at basically eliminating every husband one by one while she was having them, but not fast enough because he was able to create uh, new life. So basically, she has problems moving out of the region, and those figures are completely different between men or male and female in, in this region. The last uh, slide, the targets are also completely different or slightly different for um, male suicide bombers and female suicide bombers. I would say that they are more active in those, uh, I would say, places that the groups they are fighting for uh, see a woman active. Uh, so I'm, I don't, I don't uh, support this vision of, of a woman, but clearly for the groups they are adhered to, they see specific places where they can be active, and the targets are the, the, therefore much, much softer. So that's the end of my presentation. That's the propaganda slide. So if you, if you like us, please make sure we know it and uh, visit us on our website. Thank you very much for your atten uh, attention, and I'm looking forward to the questions.